and welcome back to Janky AF. Now, here we have a beautiful 2021, is this a 2021, Ed? Yeah, 2021. This is a 2021 Ford Mustang Mach-E in a brilliant silver gunmetal metallic. Now, that's definitely not the official color name, but it looks right, right? And uh, that's Mr. Ed in the background, and he's uh, been kind enough to let us drive this car. He just purchased this car and actually sold me his uh, old Volkswagen Jetta for uh, the hefty sum of $10. And I'll tell you more about that in another video, but uh, he's being a very good uh, partner here installing some gutters for his uh, wonderful lady Maya. And um, this car was a replacement for that Jetta and um, we're gonna drive it. So here we go, janky do thanky. Hey. Okay, so here's the thing about the Mustang. The Mustang is a staggering figure in the automotive world. Since its first full model year in 1965, Ford has produced well over 10 million Mustangs. I say full model year, I count of the 1964 and a half Mustang, yet another distinction it has is possibly the only car to be released with a model year that contained a fraction. Within just two years, Ford had already sold one million examples of the pony car, another distinction it has as single-handedly having created an entire genre of automobile. And with the help of Carroll Shelby and others, the Mustang secured its place as a true performance car, becoming not just a boulevard cruiser with a pretty face, but also a serious and capable race car. So the Mustang moniker and ethos has since the very beginning been strong and has to be revered and respected. However... While the Mustang has had many successful and varied incarnations, it's hard not to define it by its origins, a timelessly styled sporting car with humble roots and an almost endless potential for modding and tuning. But since then, it's been somewhat of a mixed bag. Take the Mustang II, for example, a rather unloved, albeit staunchly defended by some, sophomore attempt largely the creation of one Lee Iacocca, who was also instrumental in the creation of the first-generation car. Mr. Iacocca, in addition to his stellar work as a butter substitute spokesman, is just as legendary and ubiquitous in the automotive world as the Mustang itself. The Mustang II lasted only five years, from 1974 to 1978, and while it was an early example of successfully predicting and adapting to the whole 70s malaise-era gas crisis thing, had rather awkward looks and decreased performance numbers. A fun fact is that one of its engine choices was the 2.3 liter inline 4, and if I'm not mistaken, this is the same engine offered a decade later in my 1986 Ford Aerostar. The Mustang II was also based on the underpinnings of an existing Ford product, the wildly derided Ford Pinto. But this is actually not a strange fact if you know your Mustang history, as the first-gen Stang was actually based on the 1960 Ford Falcon. In fact, it wasn't until 2005 that the Mustang could boast its own dedicated platform, as the third-gen Fox-body Mustangs were referred to as such because they shared their basic chassis with 14 other models. To be clear, None of this is a bad thing. Most supercars are in many ways parts bin cars, as they are often built in small volumes and cannot be profitable without borrowing window switches and climate control buttons from existing engineering, design, and manufacturing. My point is simply that while the Mustang brand is incredibly strong, and deservedly so, it's been from its inception a long series of borrowing and compromises. So in an era where you have both the emergence of electric cars and the emergence of exotic sports car companies making SUVs, an electric sports car SUV from Ford in some ways seems to cry out for the Mustang name. But if all that sounds like a bunch of apologist mumbo jumbo, consider this. Ford credits the naming of the Mustang to executive stylist John Najjar, who as the story goes was a fan of the World War II fighter plane called the P-51 Mustang. So if you're mad at Ford for giving an SUV the Mustang namesake, just imagine the outrage of James Kindleberger, whose design team created the aircraft in 1940. His Mustang had 1,400 horsepower, a top speed of 500 miles an hour, a range of 2,000 miles, and also machine guns. So you can just imagine his incredulity at the sight of a gussied-up Ford Falcon. 
But if you really want to dive into it, Kindleberger himself must have been a fraud because he simply stole the name from some poetic Spanish fella trying to describe wild, majestic horses with no name and no master. Although technically Mustang horses aren't wild, they're actually considered feral. All right, let's just drive the car, shall we? All right, and welcome back to Janky AF. We'll uh, slide into drive here on our 2021 Mustang Mach-E. We're gonna take a quick little jaunt to the Texas thrift store and a perfect little ride to test out this little buggy. So after uh, years and years of, maybe you can see it, this uh, 2002 Jetta uh, station wagon, manual transmission, which I'm only mentioning because I bought off Edward for the hefty sum of $10. I'll tell you about that. He went ahead and pet purchased this Mustang Mach-E. Um, now his decision-making process, for a long, long time, he wanted like a BMW 3 Series. Now he lives in Texas, Houston to be exact. It's very hot here. Air conditioning's a must. And finally, the he couldn't justify it to himself, but the AC went on the Jetta. It's gonna be like $3,000 or something to repair. So, uh, you know, the, the search started in earnest. And, um, Believe it or not, Edward works in the oil and gas industry, and yet an electric car was highly, highly appealing to him. Now, that's not maybe as ironic as you think it is, but certainly lends itself to a good story. So he got on the waiting list for a Tesla Model Y, and it was gonna be uh, four to eight weeks, I believe they said, um, but he really needed a car, and you know, availability, uh, is the best ability sometimes, as they say. So, um, he started scouring for the Mustang Mach-E, as it was really kind of the only competitor to Tesla. And we talk about this car, you're not gonna get around a comparison to Tesla. I mean, that's, that's, I don't think Ford would say any otherwise. I don't think anyone would say any otherwise. This really is, I mean, comparing a Chevrolet Bolt to a Tesla, is not really um, a fair comparison. Now, I think the Bolt is a good car. I would love to drive it. Um, but this is really the competitor in terms of price, in terms of sort of the sportiness of it, the performance of it, in terms of getting something that's really, you know, um, an aspirational car in, in some respects. Now, it's not much of a car guy, I don't think he would say, but uh, he wanted something that was going to get him to and from work, be able to be on highway traffic, and obviously electric car was very appealing for many, many reasons. So he scoured uh, the Houston area and he was able to find a Mach-E. So he canceled his Model Y deposit and uh, this is what he wound up with. He wanted one in red, but this gray color, silver gunmetal metallic as I'm calling it, uh, grew on him quite a bit. And I have to say it does look very, very nice on this car. I think it's a great color and I'm not a huge, uh, <laughs> I've gotten some chagrin from this from my friends, but I'm not a huge silver car person, but I think this dark gray, especially with metallic, looks very, very nice. I'm a big fan of it. I love the looks of this car in general. I think it's a beautiful car. Um, I, I really like the back end in particular and the swooping arch in the back, the fact that it's a hatchback, I think is very cool. Um, and I would even go so far as to say it looks better than a Model Y. I actually think the Model 3 is a little bit more attractive than the Model Y. Model Y looks a little, a little funny to me, um, but that's just the looks department. So in the grand scheme of things, neither here nor there, but it is important. And speaking of reasons that people buy cars that aren't necessarily like engineering reasons, um, when you talk about the Mustang Mach-E, you will invariably run into the debate and the hundreds upon hundreds of YouTube comments, it's not a Mustang, it's not a Mustang, is it a Mustang, is it not a Mustang? Now hopefully you've seen the little intro to this video where I go into a little bit more depth into that, but I will say from a, a casual perspective, and even, even from an enthusiast perspective, because of what I'm about to say, that I'm gonna go, I'm gonna fall into this is a Mustang camp. Now in Houston, there are Mustangs as far as the eye can see. You can't drive down a block without seeing a Mustang. They're all over, old ones, new ones. Um, they're all over the highway. People have modded them, decked them out. And Ed is actually a great case study for this car because like when, when we're talking about it, I'll say, hey Ed, can I take the Mustang out? Or can I drive the Mustang to the bagel shop? Or you mind if I take the Mustang? So I'm calling it a Mustang. Um, 
And I don't think that's just lip service because he has told me that he's gotten waves from Mustang owners. He's not a car person. He's never had to like talk about cars. Whenever he stops somewhere, I would say filling up for gas, but obviously he's not filling up for gas. Uh, people uh, barrage him with questions about this car to which he doesn't really know the answers, but the enthusiasm for this car is there. And I think that's the untold story of this car. Um, people stop him. He got pulled over by a police officer the other day and he's here he is, you know, about to soil his pants, wondering what he did wrong. And the cop pulls him over and just wants to ask him questions about this car. So going to the, what I think I'm going to call the title of this video, the people have spoken. Okay. Like it, it, I don't really, I mean, of course, everything's up for debate. I think it's a Mustang. I'm happy to call it Mustang. And for me, that's the end of it. Now, I don't know the exact performance figures of this car, but I'm willing to bet that it's faster, <laughs> certainly than most stock Mustangs and even some modded Mustangs. I mean, it's a quick car as we'll hopefully get onto a more main road and we can show you that. I don't want to rip it over these speed bumps and catch air right here. And uh, sorry, this isn't going to be the greatest driving video, but we are in sort of a suburban residential area here and uh, you know, I'm not going to do anything foolish. Um, boy, I don't know if you can see this on camera. We're just passing a great Bronco. Speaking of great Fords. And that's the other thing. It's a Ford. I love that Ford has mounted a successful or what I'm deeming successful or worthy challenger to Tesla. And if you really look at the market, I mean, sure, you have the Porsche Taycan, you have the Audi e-tron, but this thing has, uh, I think, better range than those two cars. Um, a, you can get it in all-wheel drive. Um, so it's got that. And to me, it just has the sort of provenance and the sort of sense of occasion that is rivaling this like sort of disruptive upstart to Tesla. And when you look over that front hood, they've done a wonderful job of making it look like a Mustang bonnet. Now, obviously one that's been jacked up and like has an SUV status, but the whole thing with the Mustang not being, uh, this car not being a Mustang, it's like, well, you know, Ferrari's about to come out with an SUV. You know, Bentley has SUVs, Jaguar has SUVs, Lamborghini has SUVs. So for Ford to make a, a sort of sports car SUV and call it the Mustang, I really don't think in this day and age that's, that's sacrilege. And um, I don't wanna make the whole review about that, but it does seem to be the thing that's gotten the most tension. But you know, as, as the old adage goes, any publicity is good publicity. And I think that Ford took a risk in naming this that, um, and, and I really don't see any downside to it. Um, now you are sitting very high up, but you still get that sort of Mustang feel in it, um, just you know visually when you're looking out over it. I have to say the interior, I really, really like the interior. I, I, the quilted stitching on the seats, it's very nice. Um, I am just gonna rip it a little bit here. There's not anyone coming, so let's do a quick acceleration. Okay. It's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not slow. Okay. If you need to change lanes, if you need to merge, it has all the electric car instant torque feel to it. And it's very silent and, um, it's a lovely place to be. I, I, I do want to know if the steering wheel came from an actual Mustang. I would have loved if they actually took like a straight up Mustang wheel and put it in there. Um, that would be interesting to know. Now, when you come to a stop, you can't really hear it now because the AC is on and stuff, but it makes this sound like, you know, in an action movie, right about when something really exciting is about to happen, they kind of like slow down the speed and you'll hear this like bass drop noise where it goes, Woo. I don't know if it does that without the regenerative braking on, but with the regen on, it'll go Woo, right when you come to a, a stop. And I think that's kind of a cool thing. Now, maybe it's a gimmick um, and maybe you get tired after a while, but it's the little details like that that I do appreciate on this car. The interior is beautiful. It has a big screen that's straight out of the Tesla playbook. And what I really like about it, I don't know, I'm supposed to make it the left turn here there, Stacy. Um, what I really like about it is that they've done one simple little thing that I think will prevent a lot of the irks and ires of dealing with a fully touch screen monitor, which is they put this big knob in here. So you have this big analog knob that you can turn, um, you know, your volume up and down with. And I think that's so good because if nothing else, like if you're listening to music and, and or radio or whatever, sometimes you just got to turn down the volume and having that big knob you can just instantly reach for, I think is really, really nice. Um, I really appreciate that. I think it's a great feature. And also you have this secondary screen right here. So you can, 
um, you know, just have your miles per hour. It even has a navigation on it, it has your range on it. And that little tiny screen right there, I really, really appreciate. So, and, and I would say that the quality of the materials in this is, is a little bit nicer than Tesla as well. Um, now I know like Sandy Monroe and, and you know, no shade against Sandy Monroe, but like he said, oh, the cooling system in this is not, you can't touch Tesla. And I think no one's, I think the fact that Tesla is ahead of the game in engineering is not really a debate. But in terms of reaching consumers and appealing to consumers and selling cars, not that you wanna sell um, you know, an inferior product to everyone, but in the spirit of every car is a great car, you know, we'll have to see how this thing holds up over the long run. But <laughs> it's an impressive car. I mean, it, uh, driving the Jetta around for uh, the last few days, you're sitting low to the ground, it's making all sorts of noises, and, and I appreciate all those things, but if you wanna ride in a quiet, comfortable, and um, you know, safe place, I know people like sitting high, this car does inspire a lot of confidence um, when you're just driving around in it. The quilted seats, okay, whatever. These door handle pulls are very reminiscent of my Ford Aerostar and, I'll, and my 1986 Ford Aerostar. And I'll try to put a little clip of that door handle in and, and splice it with this one. Um, but I like, and, and on the, the door card there too, on the outside, there's the numbers and Ford's like really famous. The only one that does it, these like little number system, you can unlock, unlock your car with the numbers. That goes back to like Crown Vicks and all that stuff, Grand Marquis. So, you know, it, it, it feels like a, a Ford product and I'm kind of a Ford guy, so I appreciate that. I appreciate that it's got the heritage and I think that's what that's what I really want in the EV market is I want them, uh, Tesla's great, I love Tesla, but I think there should be some middle ground between being like a complete Tesla fanboy, you know, I, it has negative connotations, but like just an absolute diehard Tesla enthusiast, I want the market to produce other vehicles that have their own legacy provenances to them. Here's a beautiful Nissan Frontier right there. Wow, that is janky AF. Um, and I think Ford has done that with this car. Another thing I love about the interior is you have the speaker system actually integrated into the dashboard. So it's part of the dashboard, which a lot of dashboards often where they sort of um, skimp on material quality, so I really appreciate that. This like aluminum carbon fiber look, you know, that's whatever. Um, another thing I really, really appreciate this car is it has a power button. Now, <laughs> on Teslas, uh, at least the ones I've driven, there's not really a power button, so it's always a little confusing as to whether or not the car is on, or, or, or even more importantly, whether it's off. You get out of the car, it's like, well, do, do, do I turn it off? Is it just on? Like, you know, if I have like a I don't know, some appliance or something that I'm driving around or that I'm just using in everyday life. I wanna know if it's off. I don't wanna leave it running. Um, it's just confusing to me. And again, I'm sure the younger generation, all this stuff will be intuitive, so it doesn't really matter. But to people who are you know, my age buying a new car, I like that it has some stuff that makes me feel comfortable that I know that I can sort of immediately relate to. Um, you have a big gauge cluster. Now let's talk about a few a few little drawbacks I've noticed in this car. Um, the 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 shifting lever. I like the the spinny dial gauge. It's got a little bit of play in it. It doesn't feel like the highest quality in terms of the action. I wish it was a little heavier and a little more solid. Um, it's not bad. It just got, it has a little springy play into it. I'm sure you can turn the regenerative braking off in this, um, but I find that. Um, at low speeds, it's like high speeds is good. One pedal driving. If you're not going to do three pedal driving, you might as well take out the second pedal too. I love regen. I love that it puts energy back in your car. Um, I appreciate all these things. But at low speeds, um, it is a little weird. Um, and then also you find the regenerative braking in reverse. So you're just trying to like slowly back in someone and you, and you can't even like creep with the car without it immediately shutting off um, or slowing down. And that's kind of like a weird thing that it just takes getting used to, like nitpicky things, you know? And there goes another Mustang now. Let's see if he'll wave to us. Oh, I didn't get a wave, but that's all right. Um, we're gonna like goose it, oh, a little bit more one time here. Again, you, you got, you got power. You, <laughs> Uh, it is fun and it's addictive and, and, it, and it really has that going for it. 
And now I get a bleep that I'm going to be in the school zone in 300 feet and not get a $8,000 ticket and potentially hit a child. So that's a nice thing that modern cars do for you. Um, the other nitpicks I have with this car, um, sometimes like when you're at a standstill and you go to go forward, there's just a little bit of a lurch in the car. Um, and I don't find that in Tesla's. I, I feel like that's like a maybe a little bit of a you know, engineering lapse or just something about the, the thing just feels a tiny bit sloppy just in that one moment when you're starting and stopping. Um, the, the side view mirrors, I got to say, are a little awkward. Um, they feel like really big, but the mirror itself doesn't give you that much visibility. So that's kind of a weird thing. Um, there's our little Mustang buddy right there. Hey, bud. Um, but, you know, what more can I say about this car? It, it's a great car. Um, the last thing I'll say, and going back to the beginning, when Ed made his decision, the other factor that was playing into that was with Tesla, he could no longer get uh, the tax rebate, whereas with the Mustang Mach-E, he got like a $7,500 tax credit. So it has that going for it too. And again, a lot of these things, like maybe the engineering is not as brilliant as Tesla and it doesn't have all like the Tesla minimalism, but some people don't want that. And right now it's a really, really desirable car to buy if you can find one, because you know, it's not like it's super easy to find as opposed to a Tesla, but I think you can find one. Um, and with that tax credit and with the interior, um, and the exterior, I really like the looks of it. I think it, it the backside in particular, like I mentioned, is um, every bit Mustang. You have like the, the turn signals that come on and the yellow and red, the amber and red combination, I really appreciate. Um, and, you know, people, I think, give the Mustang a hard time for those turn signals, but everybody's copying it, like Audi's copying it. As far as I know, the Mustang was doing it before Audi did. Um, and so that's kind of a feather in Ford's cap too. Um, so for a lot of reasons this car is a very great car and um there's another mustang right there i was hoping we'd see some on this drive so uh you know what can i say it's it's a great ride it offers a uh, great you know range or fuel economy i also couldn't in good faith uh leave this detail out which are the seat belt covers which have like a sort of soft velvet felt kind of padding on them um, I'm not sure if this is just for comfort, but uh, it's incredibly weird and I really, really like it. All right, back to the review. And you'll notice I'm not putting a lot of numbers on screen. You guys can look all that up. You guys and gals can look all that up. These reviews uh, are more just one about the particular car itself as opposed to like the model at all. Um, and it's supposed to just be a nice drive and a nice story time. Um, all the numbers, all the specs, all that stuff, all the, you know, like I heard people talking the other day about new cars, like there's tons of features on these cars that people don't even know about, um, which is cool. I mean, a lot of modern phones are like that too. You all these features you don't know about, but for most people, they're just gonna be driving this car to and from work. They're gonna be taking it on road trips and they want a comfortable, reliable, um, stylish car that, they can feel good about owning. And I think this offers many, many reasons of why that is the case for Ed. And um, what more can I tell you? A great car. So this is Janky AF, where every car is a great car. Let's try not to get in an accident as I do my outro here. We'll give it one more pull for you. Boy, that is sensational. So thank you so much to Edward, um, not only for letting me drive this, but selling me uh, his 2002 Jetta for $10, which I have lusted after for a long, long time. I've loved that car. There'll be a video on that coming out very soon um, here on Janky AF, and uh, we do appreciate your support. Um, there's been some great comments on the channel lately, um, and I really enjoy interacting with people. Uh, the series Every Car is a Great Car has gotten um, some funny uh, comments from people and uh, you know to take off the mask it is a little tongue-in-cheek but at the same time um, I really do think every car is a great car there's a lot to appreciate about all cars and when what we're trying to do is just bring like a common the lowest common denominator of motoring and of driving and looking at the bright side of things and not getting caught up in the numbers not getting caught up in like sort of the snobbery um, and sort of like 
bitter rivalry that comes with car ownership. Yes, it's fun to debate and all that stuff, but um, we also just want to enjoy the pleasure of driving. And that's what we're doing. So we've pulled into the Texas Thrift parking lot. I'm also a big thrifter, which kind of goes hand in hand with the janky ethos. So I hope you've enjoyed this review. It's a little bit long-winded and disjointed. They all are. If that's not your cup of tea, that's okay. But uh, it certainly is mine. Let's see if we can get a shot for you of this Texas Thrift on our right-hand camera. I don't know if it'll come through, but we'll try to get it there for you. So thanks so much for coming along with us. And uh, until next time, Janky do thank you. I'm going to hit my power button to turn off the car so I know that it's off.